Hey, it's Jordan. Delighted to be joined by Derek Palmer, uh, the vice president of Amazon Labor Union. Uh, and we have Amazon uh, seems to be uh, very similar to Donald Trump at this point uh, in terms of election results. Uh, the National Labor Relations Board yesterday uh, rejected Amazon's attempt to overturn the election, um, basically rejecting their whole argument uh, against uh, certifying the Staten Island victory, uh, which you were a big part of. So tell me about what did the NLRB rule yesterday and what's the next steps? Um, yeah, um, the NLRB ruled in our favor, um, pretty much demanding that uh, Amazon bargain, bargain with the Amazon Labor Union. So they, so now Amazon is mandated that they have to bargain with you because uh, the way I read it was they were recommending and this and that. Uh, does Amazon yeah, have they, no choice? Yeah, they recommended. Um, um, Amazon also sent a message to all their workers saying that they're going to appeal it and that they're not satisfied with the results. So we're expecting an appeal. Um, we don't know if they're going to get the appeal, but they are expecting to appeal. And, you know, I feel like their their process right now is just delayed as much as possible, but uh, might be a little too late for that. Right. And um, with their appeal, they would appeal to the NLRB, the NLRB, because wasn't this initially an appeal? So they're going to try to appeal for a second time? Yeah, I think they have to, I think they're trying to take this like to like the Supreme Court. I think that's what their goal is. Uh, so tell me about with the delay, they could technically delay this so that they don't come to the table to collectively bargain for several years. It is basically it seems yeah. their intent. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's their goal. But I mean, you know, we have other plans. You know, we're going to take a lot of uh, collective action, um, and we're actually having a Zoom call coming up soon. And a lot of a lot of other buildings are want to get involved. They owe you, and all throughout the country. So. Um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna really stand together as a whole, like all workers from all different sites, and really show them what you know that the workers have a voice, and that we're gonna make a change, and we're not gonna wait around. We're we're not worried about the uh, the actual certification. You know, we're we're busy. I'm getting you know we're actually gonna plan some mini walkouts that's coming up. So they're gonna buckle up and, and get ready because it's coming. And obviously, uh, the Amazon at Albany has uh, filed for a union election. Uh, there's Amazons in Kentucky and North Carolina and elsewhere that have expressed interest in organizing. Can you tell me about, despite Amazon's, uh, you know, uh, delusions, uh, how many other uh, places have Amazon Labor Union been talking to? And how many uh, do you feel are close to potentially filing for an election? Um, well, we we actually uh, Albany is going to actually have the election in a few weeks. We don't have the actual date on that, um, but that's the closest right now. Um, we already started in New Jersey, Carteret. We started out. Um, there's a, a facility in North Carolina that wanted to start, Kentucky, all over, um, Florida, West Coast, and California. Um, so we we really getting we're really moving right now. And uh, there, uh, amidst this, can you kind of talk about what's been going on at JFK 8, Staten Island? Uh, uh, my presumption is the managers uh, have not cooled it uh, as far as the mistreatment of uh, union organizers, exploitation, or the working conditions improving. Yeah, I mean, um, right now they have their eye on you know, people who are union supporters. Um, you know, they're trying to do everything they can to monitor the movements. Uh, but, I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. You know, um, there's a lot of support here. The workers are, are supportive of us. You know, they're wearing the T-shirts. There's they're even workers wearing our, um, we have AOU vests now. So, um, you know, they're in, they're in for uphill battle. You know, this is New York. This isn't Alabama. This isn't any other state. Uh, so, I mean, they, they are trying to find a way to get rid of them, but... Essentially, they, they really can't. Um, so they're, they're in a tough spot right now. Right. And um, can you kind of uh, describe the workers at other Amazon 
Uh, what are some of the things you're hearing from them as far as the reasons they're wanting to organize similar uh, to the reasons uh, you guys organize for the union in the first place? Well, I mean, ultimately, it's the, just the mistreatment. You know, a lot of workers, they really uh, they work extremely hard. And they don't get the credit for it. You know, so a lot of workers want to move up and they're not they're not getting that opportunity. To. They'll, they'll bring in like um, other managers from fresh out of college and have them be in the same positions that they're striving for, even though they don't have the same experience that these workers have. So that's number one. And also the working conditions, is, it's extremely hot. You know, right now, it's just like, I don't even know how it is, but it's, it's extremely hot right now. And I'm sitting on my break time. Um, and also like the, the heat is so bad at other facilities that other workers even passed, passed away. And we're in um, warehouses in New Jersey. There's been three other um, deaths actually in New Jersey warehouses. Um, so the conditions are bad. Um, the pay is still ultimately low for the tri-state area. You know, 18 hours still isn't enough, but they need more. Um, and ultimately, you know, just not having the freedom to come in when they want. You know, they have mandatory overtime, and that's going to be a huge problem coming up with the holiday season. You know, they're not going to have no choice, but they're going to work these 55 hours, and they, they can't use any of the vacation time. So it's the same system, you know, ever since 2015, since I started. So I don't see any changes. That so that ultimately, that's the reason why we want to even and also I had an impact that the pandemic really and, and really show how that we are and the role that we play for the country because we were deemed essential and you know we didn't get anything for it open. So those are the main reasons why people want to use it right now. Um let me ask you last question. You know, Biden uh politicians came out after you were victorious uh, with some praise. But I haven't heard many of them, uh, you know, holding Amazon for essentially, you know, uh, trying to stop the steal, so to speak, on your historic victory. Uh, where is the political leadership to demand that Amazon recognize uh, Amazon Labor Union as the rightful uh, union and pushing them to collectively bargain? I don't see that from President Biden. I don't see that from the media. Uh, seems like a pretty big deal when the second largest company in America refuses to, you know, accept election results and collectively bargain with a elected union. Yeah, I'm honest. I'm gonna be honest. I, I thought they would get more support, you know, after um, Biden said Amazon were coming for you. So I'm thinking he's gonna be on top of everything, but it hasn't really been the case. Um, but I mean, we have gotten support from Jessica Ramos, who's trying to help pass the uh the warehouse protection act which actually made that act we just need the governor of new york to pass that um uh, so that's that's the, the the issue that we're facing right now but i mean we we had some we definitely had support but not the support that we expected but you know we're, we're mainly just focused on organizing and making the change from within because that's the real change so waiting on politicians isn't really going to get it done we're just going to have to do the work ourselves Thanks, Derek Palmer, VP of Amazon Labor Union. Uh, we'll stay in touch. And by the way, huge uh, labor rally coming up for you guys on Monday, on Labor Day. I, I hear you visiting Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz's penthouse, uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, little penthouse in uh, New York City, and then uh, finishing in Times Square with a major rally. So uh, we'll be covering it. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time. All right, thank you. My grandmother worked at a bakery in Ottumwa back in the day. Her, She was a widow raising two kids. It was a unionized bakery. She couldn't afford the union dues. So the union let her take notes during their meeting and made her her secretary so she could be in the union. So she was working. The union looked out for her. There was a new um, procedure for wrapping bread that the bakery was making, so they made sure she got that job. It paid a little more. She was a widow raising two kids. 
So when men came back from the war, they were saying the women in the workforce were taking the men's jobs. And so the union said, no, this was a new job, came up during the war. She's not taking a job from anybody. It's her job as long as she can do it. Well, then she had a hysterectomy. And she went back to work. But part of her job was to carry the um, this sheet with the bread on it from point A to point B. And, you know, her doctor didn't want her to do it. She had to work. I mean, this is a woman who, when the Tumwa had their flood, walked across a flooded bridge to get home to her kids. So the union helped her keep her job. Some union guy took that bread for her until she could carry it herself. This is generational. Unions are important. And Waterloo supports the union. First and foremost, like throughout the pandemic, especially, we've been called essential workers. And just having lived through the pandemic and being called that and understanding that the conditions and the living standards that we have, it's just simply unacceptable. And I think we're trying to change the working conditions, not only for Starbucks workers, but, you know, hopefully this leads to, to more people being able to say, you know, enough is enough. I also want a better working environment and an actual say in my workplace. They gave us completely against our wishes, two additional support managers. What they're supporting other than the anti-union campaign remains to be seen. There's as many people they brought in here, almost as many I believe, as people voting in the union election. That's not, that's a type of disruption you're not supposed to do. Um, I'm a regular at a couple of the stores here. Um, they've taken the stores that I know people at and they disrupted them by doubling the size of the people at times. That's dangerous. Two of our committee just got COVID. They were part of a, they were put into a work situation um, purely as a way to disrupt about the union. The timeline, you know, lines up that within those 12 days from like October 1st to the 12th is, is probably <laughs> when we would have gotten COVID right before we went out. Um, on the isolation and the only thing that's really been different in my life is that I've been working with upwards of 10 to 15 or 10 like 10 extra people 12 13 extra people and that's just people on the floor like if we have 16 partners that are working on the floor we also have like four to five managers that are hovering around in the lobby in the back of house talking to each other the amount of people packed into that building tripled in that week you know it, it's like it, it would be hard to kind of attribute this to anything else solely because that change was so drastic. And not even to mention the people who are coming in are coming in from all over the country. This is not like local or anything. Like if there's outbreak from travel or anything like that, like any, any, anything could be possible. And, uh, you know, we can only see it as both a tactic to disrupt a very strong pro-union store to, you know, scare workers, to intimidate them, and to basically break their solidarity. And we had to sit through three days of them basically telling us that not only are we essential, essentially coffee robots that can just be put anywhere and assigned a position and we don't have to have any say in it, but that our managers who've worked very, very hard to take care of these stores and take care of us under these awful conditions don't actually have any say in what goes on. We are worth living wages and we are worth like having safe working conditions. But without baristas, there would be no Starbucks. Without people like us on the ground, we are what makes Starbucks what it is. And you know, Kevin Johnson just got a $20 million bonus over the pandemic. Well, you know, we were the ones in the stores. Most of my coworkers got sick with COVID, if not all of them. So, you know, just wanted to say too, that Starbucks has the ability to, raise living standards and they've chosen not to. It's usually the first 25, 30 minutes is them talking at us. And generally, at this point, it's all anti-union. It started off the first two meetings, we're kind of, um, we're here to help you, you raised your hand, we're so excited to be here and fix things. And then they've gotten progressively, they've broken us into smaller groups. Um, they've scheduled these so that the most vocal of us are in one group and the quieter people are in other groups. So I mean, it's, it's blatantly obvious to us, and I'm, I'm sure that they know that. I'm just not so sure that they care. Unions come out of, you know, struggles of working class people from, you know, the 1800s and before. Um, you know, and we know what a union is. We know what the values of a union are. It's to support working class people. 
Um, you know, so Starbucks was piecing together every um, you know piece, bad piece of information they could find on unions to create this kind of uh, like a collage of anti-union messages. Um, they were pulling um, you know practices from the trade unions, from different unions from different sectors, you know, uh, to try to, to intimidate workers. You know, they'll do anything but actually talk about you know what unions actually do. They also put up the financials of the union to try to explain that you know the the higher echelon of the union, as you will, are making lots of money and that's my dues paying paying into their salary. So I asked them if I could see Starbucks financials and they said, well, that's public information. And I said, well, this is all public information as well, but you spent time to make a 25 minute PowerPoint about it. I said, can you explain to me why I shouldn't be concerned that our CEO got a $20 million bonus in the middle of a pandemic and I have partners who can't afford to pay their rent and put groceries in their fridge on the same week? They kept saying, well, the union is a business. And I said, as opposed to Starbucks non-for-profit? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, wh who are we trying to fool here? You know, you guys say you're anti, you're not anti-union, yet this is the most anti-union thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, how can you say that? And they were like, well, we're just giving you the facts. Well, it's like, okay, well, how come you can give your facts, yet when we try to provide information, you tell me that that's my opinion? They, the entire last listening session was a 25-minute PowerPoint that ripped apart the Workers United Constitution. It was fear-mongering, and I called it out as fear-mongering. I also asked if they could juxtapose, juxtapose with that constitution with Starbucks constitution, to which I was told they don't have a constitution. So I asked what they had, and they said, well, we have policies and procedures. And I said, okay, well, who votes on those policies and procedures? And they said, well, nobody. I said, so there's no democratic system set up that allows me to have a say in my workplace. Well, no. I said, well, that's not helpful to me. I brought pamphlets to my store that were sitting in the back room, just like where they put their information out. And mysteriously, a group of corporate people came into my store. And then when I went back there after they left, all my pamphlets were gone. But their whole issue with the with the union was it was third party, third party, third party going to come between us and our, our ability to communicate with one another. And like you just said, you've got partners who have been their stores have been flooded with corporate to the point where they don't even know who they're supposed to talk to anymore in the case of an emergency and you have COVID and you've got to make 10 phone calls to get a hold I mean that's not that's not the partner to partner communication they've been professing so they've kind of hurt themselves in a lot of ways they've been doing a lot of talking and it's it's been a lot of sort of do as I say not as I not as I do I know partners that have been here for 10 years that have never had these listening sessions, which are apparently really common and we should have in theory already. That's what we've been seeing in the stores. I've never heard of that as a labor lawyer. We're working with organizers with, you know, many decades of experience. Nobody involved in this campaign has seen anything like this. But I believe, you know, the union anti-union efforts are going to only intensify now, especially now that we have a month-long process of waiting for these mail-in ballots to come in and be counted. Um, you know, I think, you know, what we saw, you know, prior to getting this ruling is just going to be a prelude to an even more massive anti-union campaign ramping up. Um, so I'm sure, you know, there's going to be, uh, if not weekly meetings, maybe almost like, um, bi-weekly meetings, if not more. I've always said companies like money more than they hate unions. I found the company now that hates unions more than they like money. Um, I, if I was a shareholder and watch the level of their spending here of anything to spend, I would be concerned. Is this a model? You couldn't take this model across the country. Um, the amount they're spending on all these executives? Yeah, the amount you're, you're doubling and tripling the store managers. Um, that's going to, you know, and you're also people are just being jammed in and just closing down stores. Walden and Anderson, where we had over 80 percent signed up, um, and we've since we petitioned for an election, even though it was withdrawn for a technical reason, would normally be found. It was closed as a cafe. Go away customers, go away workers, and the workers are dispersed into the airport Starbucks where they doubled up. Uh, so tell me about what uh, made you guys decide to go on strike. Uh, and what has been the response from your managers and corporate? I mean, as a whole, we're just fed up with the union busting. It's becoming too much and we need to take direct action. Um, the biggest thing happened where uh, Starbucks released a benefits package across the country and they're not offering it to unionized stores and they're trying to say, oh, it's because of the unions. We can't do it. We're not allowed to. We would do it if we could. That's not the case. Um, I would also, if 
further about our uh, bargaining. At our specific store, it's really been a problem with getting the stores properly scheduled. We've been closing nonstop. The customers are fed up with it. We're fed up with it. We just want to work our hours so we can pay our bills. We have, honestly, a pretty ridiculous turnover rate, I think especially for the type of work that we do. Um, and a lot of the ways that Starbucks sells themselves is a really great company to work for. They think that people are in there for the long haul. But because our turnover rate is so crazy, we can't train people fast enough, um, you know, for how fast we're losing them. And so what ends up happening is we're throwing people in before they're really ready. So they can't carry the store the way that management wants them to, which is completely understaffed because they understaff to meet their sales goals. Um, and the other side of that is if somebody calls out because we are so severely understaffed on purpose, we have to close the store because there's nobody to work. In reality, it really seems like they would rather run their stores into the ground and run their partners into the ground um, rather than bargain with the union and give us the things that we need and the things that we're asking for and the things that they promised to give us and are now trying to take away. We all know about Trump's fence and, and build the wall. Well, Amazon has literally erected a wall within the past uh, or a fence within the past few weeks uh, to make it harder uh, for wor workers here to unionize. Uh, I guess they're taking what they did in Alabama, doubling and tripling down. So I'm here with uh, Derek Palmer. Uh, you still work in uh, the warehouse and you've kind of been leading uh, along with Christian who was fired and a couple others. You're kind of leading this effort to uh, pick up the mantle, I guess, from Alabama and uh, try to get a successful, the first union in America with Amazon. Uh, so you recently filed uh, with the National Labor Relations Board a grievance yes. because they're already union busting. So I want to get into that. Uh, Christian Smalls, uh, everybody should know. Um, well, they put it up after our, one of our barbecues. Uh, we held the barbecue for all associates, you know, to come and get, get some real food, you know, versus the food inside of Amazon and also to sign union cards and also get information about union cards as well. And um, right after the day after that barbecue, you know, they, I guess they saw that it was a huge success. You know, a lot of people were signing up. And then we came back. Um, I believe the next day we, you know, we weren't here, but the day after that we came back and the fence was here. And uh, I don't know if you could say, show them, John, but it's literally private property all over the fence, uh, even though I believe we're on a public sidewalk. Yeah. Do, do you feel like uh, the progressive politicians, particularly AOC, Bernie, kind of uh, abandoned you while, while supporting other workers? No, I mean, I think they're too busy getting coffee at Starbucks. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't really call it. <laughs> I, I don't. I can't explain it either, you know. This is this once again uh, questions that you have to ask them, you know, why they haven't supported their own constituents. <laughs> you know, I have people that's organizers that come from their district that was looking forward to seeing them come out here. It's, it's sad and unfortunate. And once again, you know, these are y'all elected officials. You know, I'm from New Jersey, but you know, the workers that I'm organizing with and the workers that I'm fighting for are from New York. And they're from Jackson Heights. They're from the Bronx. They're from Harlem. They're from Brooklyn. They're from all these different districts and counties and boroughs in New York. So any progressive politician could have showed up in the last 11 months. You know, and that's all I have to say about that. You know, we don't, you know, I know that my team and the way we organize, we don't care about the outside noise and, you know, who's supporting, who's not. We just do what we do. And unfortunately, you know, win or lose, um, you know, people are going to look back and they're going to be like, yo, where the hell was y'all? And they will have to answer to that. You know, not us. We know who we was. We know what we did. We invited them. I personally invited them. Derek personally invited them. We went to Washington. Um, they have my information. They have my direct contact. I'm very accessible. I'm busy, but, you know, I, I try to make time for everybody. And uh, they know that. TikTok, the, the clock is ticking. We're, we're, we're calling you out on your bullshit, politicians. You need to you need to speak up. This is clearly revolutionary change. And we're here for the people and you need to speak up. So I've seen multiple of you support the, the Bessemer campaign last year. Where are you for us? It, there's many of many of you that are politicians that are in New York City that you have 
delegates in your own district that are workers. We have workers not only in all five boroughs, but from all over the country and internationally. There are organizers, including myself, who came from Arizona. We have California, uh, Florida, and even Canada. Organizers are here to try and make change because we know it's so desperately needed. Where are you? you know, like Chris said, you know, we, we, we invited them out here and they said they were going to come, but last minute, you know, changed their mind. So, uh, you know, they've been absent ever since, but you know, that we can't let that discourage us. You know, we just got to keep moving, you know, keep, keep, keep our movement alive because these workers are dependent on us. They looking at us as leaders. So that's all we got to do is just keep is continue to lead by example, win, lose a draw. So they've specifically said like, oh, you're doing such a good job. We're getting like letters from patients saying you're doing a good job. So it's almost like even though we're still doing a good job and we still care and we're still trying hard, it's more of like, because you can, you have to. Like on yeah. my floor specifically, they added an extra room. So what it used to be a room for like to do echoes, like in like heart, whatever, ultrasounds. And somehow the next day I came back and they switched it to a patient's room so they can add more patients. So we're originally like a 48 bed unit and then they added the, 40, the extra room and I, ask people, I'm like, how is this possible when we don't even have the staff to take care of the 48 patients we have now? The, the COVID patients are horrified. They're, they're so scared because, like, they're stuck in isolation. Their family members can't visit them. Like, I can't imagine, like, this is the face that they see. And it's not even, like, my face. It's, like, a mask and, like, a full-gown PPE screaming to them because they can't hear me because whether they have a high flow mass, like it's like this hot air blowing up your nose, like at like 100% oxygen, like it's painful, it's super loud, it can get sweaty for them. Like they're uncomfortable, they're crying, they miss their family, they just want to get better. It's sad, it's a sad sight. And normally like we could have the honor of being one of those visitors and people to take care of those patients, just considering they can't have family, they can't have visitors. Some of them don't even have smartphones to like FaceTime family. My grandfather was actually recently here on a COVID unit. And um, the fact that he didn't have visitors for nearly two weeks um, and the staff taking care of him was the only people that he saw for that amount of time. Um, that is just very unfortunate that we don't even have the time right. to see. It doesn't sound like the staff could adequately care. Right. It's basically like factory line working, going through a patient at giving them their meds, giving their assessment. I can't even like have a full blown conversation. I'm like, oh, are you in pain? How are you feeling? Like, I'll ask my orientation questions. And that's like basically the conversation. You guys are going on 30 days. It's not easy to go on strike. Uh, obviously, uh, it seems like they're threatening your benefits now, your health care, uh, important for health care yeah. workers. Yeah. Um, what has been their response? Do you think they're operating in good faith? Is, are they negotiating in good faith? Have they basically told you to take a hike? Well, what has been the response? Personally, I don't think they're bargaining in good faith. They're like from the union and like the bargaining team. I don't really can like speak for them, but like I know like they'll post like, oh, we we're still waiting for Catholic Health to come up. Like they're do no call, no shows. Like they the bargaining team is waiting hours on hours for whoever the bargaining team for Catholic Health is to come and talk to them. And they're not showing up. Yeah, you said? yeah, they don't show up, or they show up at like two o'clock in the morning. Like here you go. Like you can't expect someone to like read this whole paperwork and say, yeah, this is okay at two o'clock in the morning like you need to be sleeping you know yeah. and then like our environmental staff the people who are like cleaning the covid rooms cleaning everybody's rooms cleaning like the blood and guts off operating tables like they're paid like 13 dollars an hour that's not even minimum wage they can go to tim hortons and make 20 dollars an hour and not have to deal with the risks that they're doing here you know so talk to the audience uh, obviously understaffing what are some of the other demands you guys have been making um, in the beginning, they proposed to take away like our health insurance. They wanted to give us a high deductible health insurance. They wanted to do that. They didn't want to give us like a huge wage increase. Oh, and they wanted to get rid of our pension. Oh, so like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like all the senior nurses, not only are they they're not getting the wage, their pension is being frozen. And like, what? Pashan was 38 and uh, in January uh, suddenly came home, uh, told her sister her, her head hurt. And then the next day she passed away in her sleep, uh, no major health problems. But the only thing we do know is that uh, for months she was actually at Amazon in Virginia administering COVID tests, the nasal swabs, up her co-workers' noses, uh, something that she had spoken with you about, other workers, 
said that they saw her doing the testing. Uh, Amazon would not speak with me on the record. They would not, they tried to sweep this under the rug. They actually, from what I know, intimidated workers there in that warehouse from even talking about your sister's death. So I want to start with, you know your sister was doing this testing and you and her, because you had worked at Amazon with her, you and her had, had rarely fought, but you had kind of gotten into it because you were worried about her bringing something home to your mother during COVID. Yes, we got into it about two times about it. And the last time we got into it was December. And um, I told her when, when we first, when I first brought it up to her and told her um, is when she did the anonymous emails and then um, she did the text message and then, uh, then she did the emails under her information. Um, Just so you guys know, she emailed her supervisors once as herself, identifying herself, asking, are you going to close the warehouse? This was at the beginning of the pandemic about a year ago. Uh, they were not cleaning properly in this Virginia warehouse, just like they weren't cleaning properly here. Uh, they weren't even cleaning the trays that you work on, uh, that you move products. And then she emailed anonymously, uh, even, to the, even to the corporate headquarters in Seattle, basically saying that uh, they're just totally dis disregarding us and our lives during this pandemic. So yeah, the first uh, was like May was when she had when she uh, May was when she started sending the emails and she sent them from May up until I believe October, November. Um, and the last time we we got into it, uh, we got in an argument about it was December after Christmas and then my sister passed in January. Um, I just want to know, I, I, I mean, like I said, at the end of the day, you know, we uh, we got to state the facts and the facts is that she was working at Amazon. Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. during COVID testing. And she was not a doctor, nurse, a medical assistant, a, a, a medical profession, a CNA. She wasn't a RN. She wasn't anything. She came into Amazon to be a sorter. She had no business COVID testing. He had no business having employees COVID test. My sister was one of the first uh, couple of employees who were doing COVID testing. She was trained by another employee to do COVID testing, and that employee was trained by another employee to do COVID testing. No one had ever came in, no doctor had ever came in to train, no nurse had ever came in to train. Why is this happening? And also, when you see actual doctors or nurses do those swabs, they're head to toe covered. Uh, N95, goggles, gowns. Did your sister have any of that? She didn't have any of that. And I asked her because we would be on FaceTime and when she would get off the phone, when she would uh, have to test somebody, she would get off the phone because you really can't be on your phone anyway in a warehouse. But she had the Amazon check mask on and, and then she had a headband that she would wear. So she had the, the earpiece. And I asked her, I said, you, you don't even know how far to put that up somebody's nose. Why are you doing that? What if you hurt somebody? What, who's going to be responsible for that? And she said, look, you know, they, they just, they showed me what to do. And I told her I wouldn't, they, you can't, you can't do that. You, you can hurt somebody. If that thing goes too far up somebody's nose, that it, I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I don't understand how, how there was no doctors to be trained. And I, I don't understand it. It's just still, it's still now. And it's, why didn't you have doctors? Why didn't you have people come in and be trained? Why didn't you have doctors come in and nurses come in? Why didn't you have them do it? Why did you have regular employees testing employees? And now this has happened and it's two months of counseling that expires in less than 24 hours and go on with your life. And one of the only ways to fight back is by organizing in your workplace, by organizing workers, because the future is ours, we um, What got me out here today is to support um, uh, Austin, a uh, Starbucks worker who has been recently been terminated, and uh, to stand in solidarity with um, other groups, other labor groups uh, as well. I myself got fired myself, and um, I'm just here to fight the good fight, show support. We're meeting, I was in Atlantic City this past weekend. I, I met some people, for, and I'm not going to give them away yet because they don't know come, but I met people from other states that were amazed that we were there. They ran into all four founders, me, Chris, Derek, and Jordan, so it was like they would took pictures, like they're static, and you know it went to show us that how much, you know, people around at these other places need our help. Those people in ERW9 out there in Jersey, 
they definitely need our help. This is why unions are needed. There's a man dead now. Man, I ain't gonna cry right now, but... <laughs> Damn, two years ago, um, my life changed forever. You know, I only wanted to do the right thing and, and speak up for the workers behind me. Jason was one of them, Derek, Jordan, Gerald, everybody in JFK. You know, when COVID-19 came to play, Amazon failed us. They dropped the ball, they lied to the public saying they're doing all these things. None of that was the reality of our situation. So I let a walk out um, after they quarantined just me and, and nobody else. And that walkout led to my firing. Then a week after that, a couple weeks after that, maybe a week or two, that memo that came out calling me not smart or articulate. Um, ironically, they also said to make me the face of the whole unionizing efforts, which I had no intention at the time. And uh, yeah, when I read that memo, I, that motivated me to uh, start an organization called the Congress of Essential Workers, TCOEW. My brothers right here, Derek Palmer, uh, Gerald Bryson, Jordan Flowers. We traveled the country. Uh, we picked up some comrades along the way. Mm -hmm. We protested in front of every Jeff Bezos mansion and penthouse that we can find on Google. And um, it led us to uh, 11 months ago. After um, we, uh, we went down to Alabama last year when they first they had their first campaign. And uh, we, uh, we saw some things that we thought that we could do better uh, independently. So that's what we decided to do. We decided to come back home to Staten Island and start unionizing JFK. And not just JFK, we wanted all four of them. They built up four buildings in two years. So we said, you know what? This is our complex now. We tried to do four buildings, uh, the first petition. Didn't go our way because Amazon fired a thousand people in six months. Wasn't because we didn't sign up two, three thousand people. We did that. But unfortunately, by the time we filed the petition and the process took a while, uh, Amazon got rid of a thousand people, whether they quit or they got fired. I'm blaming Amazon because they have a system that get rid of people anyway. So that's what happened. Um, yeah, that too. They gave us a, 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 a faulty payroll, but it didn't matter. We were able to file right back in, in, in six weeks. And we got to an election with JFK by itself. Chris, do you have a, a message? Because a lot of mainstream media might not be aware of workers like Daquan Smith, who was fired and became homeless. Workers like Bashan Brown, uh, who was testing uh, workers uh, uh, for COVID and dropped dead suddenly. Yeah. Can you talk about the, the names that people might not know that have uh, suffered at Amazon? Yeah, there's a whole lot of names. Um, Joe Bryson is one of them. Um, Jordan Flowers is one of them. Pushan Brown, Daquan Smith, uh, myself. I've been unemployed. I need my job back, right? Um, still pending with the AG's office. Um, there's a there's a there's a lot of unheard voices, but the one that really I'm glad you brought up Pushan, Pushan Brown. She lost her life, 38 years old, black woman, testing Amazon workers, testing her coworkers, in the middle of the pandemic, leaving behind her 12 year old daughter Gabby, because Amazon made workers test each other with no facial masks, no N95s. No cleaning, no gowns, no plexiga uh, plexiglass in the warehouse. They had workers testing each other. I'm talking about Swab. And she died. She lost her life. And that company, all they did was put up the GoFundMe that we put out there. That's it. That's right. all. And, 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 and to be honest with you, you know, the more, the more I think about that, it infuriates me. But, um, Thankfully, I was able to get connected with her and, and help amplify it to some degree, but it's not enough. And, and that's, that's why unionizing and, and coming together for workers that have a platform to 
tell their stories is important. Send parts of these interviews where 24 year olds are saying, you know, I'm living with my parents because I can't get enough hours. Or 20 somethings are saying, oh yeah, this strong job market, I sent in 55 job applications that I didn't get a call back from any of them. They don't want to hire anyone. Send, uh, send the parts of these interviews where uh, tw 20 somethings, which are their kids age or their grandkids age i'm talking about the voters that keep voting for the bidens and the clintons and the obamas and the cory bookers and these establishment democrats send it to them and make sure they're seeing that yeah the people you're voting for are basically stealing a whole generation's future because they're screwing them and they're letting these corporations run roughshod over people and because they take money starbucks donates amazon donates Make sure it's not just your Republican uncle who needs to see it. It's your neoliberal auntie, okay? It's your academic in your family that keeps voting for these status quo Democrats. Because frankly, not, not to my audience, the baby boomer generation is who keeps voting. They are the most reliable voters. They are the strongest voters. They vote the most and they vote in general. And this goes across, it's not just old white people, older black voters too. They vote for the Nancy Pelosi's, the Jim, the James Clyburn's, the Cory Booker's, the Biden's, uh, the Pete Buttigieg's. They need to see, oh, no, it's not just laziness. There are no good jobs. And this is a capitalist hellscape we're living in. And if you then hear from them, well, in my day, oh, yeah, well, in your day, college wasn't sixty thousand dollars a year. You could go to you can go to uh, college. I think Elizabeth Warren said her tuition was like 500 bucks a semester. Okay, in your day, uh, you actually uh, did not. Ha you actually had unions or stronger unions. In your day, uh, rent wasn't $5,000 in a major American city. So I don't want to hear any more about your fucking day.